Hello, this is Daza Greenwood, and I realized as I was editing this video for law.mit.edu that a little preface would be in order to let you know, number one, fundamentally, this is a spotlight on not just the computational law research that's happening now um, in the research units that law.mit.edu is part of, namely in the Media Lab, Human Dynamics Group, and Connection Science, which all of which are somewhat interdisciplinary and, um, and, and cross-departmental themselves. But, but more specifically, in that area of generative AI for law. So not the law of generative AI, but how it is that generative AI is now being used for law and for legal processes. The other thing is, as I'm editing this, I'm realizing that um, my attempt to uh, produce video like this from my local park was only nominally successful and so I apologize in advance for uh, some of the audio lag and the um, and the poor bandwidth on my side but hopefully that's okay because the main attraction is our star graduate student Robert Mahari so with that said enjoy the show And now a segment that uh, you've all been waiting for and that's been long promised, a, pick, a peek rather behind the curtain on the research in, into computational law that's happening at MIT and um, here in the Media Lab and the um, MIT Connection Science uh, related research group where, um, where I serve and where um, law.mit.edu is situated. Um, and I, I want to reintroduce you all to my friend and colleague and our star grad student uh, who's um, in the midst of a PhD now at MIT. And um, after a very successful sojourn at Harvard Law School where he uh, picked up a JD um, and bef before which he was at MIT. So I think we, we can claim original um, kind of provenance of Robert Mahari in academia. He, he got two degrees, one in uh, engineering uh, chemical engineering at MIT as a youth, and uh, he's back, baby, and he's diving with both feet and his whole body into computational law, and I couldn't be more delighted than to uh, than to call you a collaborator. And so I just wanted to share in in this video, uh, as I said, a bit of a, a a bit of a look into what is happening in the research in this area. So that's a little bit different from what you'll be seeing. Um, and what, what we do in the MIT Computational Law Report and the sort of stuff that we spotlight in um, IdeaFlow and in our workshops and so forth. This is more what I consider like our day in, day out uh, at MIT, which is primarily a research institution. So with that, um, Robert Mahari, thank you so much for taking time out of your incredibly busy days um, to, to, to join again and to, and to share with people what it is that you've been working on. So. Uh, Robert, take it away. Perfect. Thank you so much, Daza, uh, for the generous introduction, as always. Um, and you deserve a lot of credit, too. Uh, you are the first person who introduced me to the whole idea of computational law. Um, so uh, thanks for that. And uh, it's been it's been a fun ride. So um, what I thought I would do today is is just share, you know, some highlights. We'll be moving quite quickly through a couple of research projects just to kind of give people a sense of what the kind of research questions are, what the open problems are. Um, and really, uh, to convey, I hope, the the kind of breadth that computational law research um, offers, um, and maybe people will be excited and want to um, collaborate. So um, with that, uh, I will start maybe um, by talking a little bit about um, legal research, um, as in the research you do when you try uh, to draft a new case, and how large language models can um, help us with that. And so as, as a very quick review and reminder, we're in a common law system, right? So uh, that is a system that's judge-made that really is uh, built on citations to precedent. And um, it's an exciting opportunity for us to leverage um, large language models to uh, predict precedent. Um, this incidentally is um, one of, I think, my favorite cases uh, from law school that involved um, a uh, conference that went completely off the rails in a hotel um, people were bringing all sorts of animals into the hotel. They were firing guns, and ultimately, a passerby was hit. 
And uh, the Minnesota Supreme Court had to figure out whether the hotel was liable. And they ended up citing um, and quoting uh, a case from New Jersey where something similar had happened. And um, the conclusion was essentially that, well, if the hotel was aware of the danger uh, that its guests posed, then it had uh, a duty to, to protect um, the innocent passerbys. Um, and so this kind of reasoning, right, like based on precedent, is ubiquitous in, in common law jurisdictions. And um, we wanted to see whether we could build a, a system that retrieves uh, past cases, um, and specifically these kinds of quotations from past cases. And then once the retrieval has been done, that generates um, an argument to be made. And so um, the task that we're going to focus on is given a legal argument that you'd like to make, um, can we predict uh, passages of relevant precedent? Um, we treat this as a classification problem. So essentially we say, look, um, let's just try to predict, given a essentially a list of all the possible precedent you could cite, let's predict um, the precedent that's most relevant um, to your specific argument. Um, we construct training data by essentially mining published judicial opinions um, and finding uh, passages of quoted precedent and then looking at the context that surrounds that precedent when it's used and trying to predict the, the passage of precedent um, given the context that surrounds it. Um, we're able to generate a tremendous amount of training data. I'll just pause to, to underscore like, you know, legal data is so rich. There's quite a lot of it. Um, and so you can create these huge data sets that allow us to do some really interesting things um, like uh, this uh, project on, on passage retrieval. Um, anyway, so we are able to create this big training data set um, and then train different models, um, one kind of more advanced transformer-based model, one simpler one. Um, and the, the key takeaway is, um, especially if we look at the kind of more advanced model, um, the correct passage um, from you know, thousands and thousands of potential options is among the top 10 or the top 20 um, retrieved examples over 90%, like 96, 99% of the time. So really impressive results. Um, large language models appear to be quite good at this. Um, I'll also flag like a much simpler um, feed, feed forward neural network. You know, this is kind of old school machine learning, performs quite well at this task. Um, and then once we have uh, the um, passages retrieved, um, which we built this little uh, demo to show people how this looks. So here we've given an input argument to the engine and it's retrieving these passages. Um, that you can see here, once these passages are retrieved, well, then we can give them to a um, model like ChatGPT. We can essentially cheat, uh, treat ChatGPT like a grammar engine, right? And we can ask it to um, write a brief based on some uh, passages of precedent that we provide, right? That, that addresses a lot of the hallucination issues. And then it will go ahead and just put it all together and uh, write a brief that um, in my opinion, is actually quite passable as kind of an initial starting point for an attorney. Um, we, we've kind of analyzed this quite a lot, and it turns out that by providing passages uh, initially, you, you really like address a lot of the hallucination issues, but you also get stylistically kind of correct briefs. Um, so something kind of interesting and further to explore. Um, so just kind of concluding this little section here, um, AI, large language models, seem to be really good at finding precedent. Um, simple models work quite well, and uh, we can then combine kind of retrieval tools with large language models um, to uh, generate some briefs. So I'm going to pause briefly here um, and uh, give Daz an opportunity to, to ask some questions. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Um, yeah, and you know, Auto Law has always been one of my favorite projects of yours. Um, and so one question I have for you, you, you sort of touched on it, but could you be a little more explicit about um, how the project has itself evolved with the evolution of generative AI. So when you started this, it was pre-chat GPT, it was pre-GPT 3.5 and some of the capabilities that that now has. Now we have GPT-4. Um, so I recall you using BERT um, mm -hmm. initially um, to uh, start to identify and classify, um, you know, some of the, like the, the key um, kind of uh, holdings and, and parts of the opinions in cases. So what, what's changed in this project with the advent of this modern generation of, um, of AI and, and, and how? Yeah, so um, I, I think I and we as a community have been quite lucky um, to have been around like really at this cusp, right? Where like AI was good enough to do interesting things four or five years ago. Now it's like really good. Um, and it can do all these new things. So um, when we first started this, it was really focused on retrieving the precedent. And the idea was like, look, let's just 
focus on doing what a legal research platform does already, right? Like helping you find the precedent you're looking for. Um, we had thought and like considered, you know, well, maybe we could do like some sort of word plugin where, you know, you're typing along and you press tab and uh, the plugin just suggests what you should cite at that um, place. But what large language models can do is the generation piece, right? They, they can generate really high quality text. Now, they're, they're not necessarily like natively good at uh, finding uh, the legal precedent, but that's the research that we've been doing for years. So we are good at that. And combining the two um, has led to some really exciting things, right? Where we can take all of the infrastructure we've built for uh, legal research and then layer on top of that, the generative AI kind of language model um, to, to produce text. Um, and I think this, uh, I think we're, we're at the start of something. It'll be exciting to see how lawyers actually leverage this. Um, but the possibilities I think are significantly expanded now, um, in good ways and bad that, that hopefully, uh, people can kind of think about, um, some of the risks here as well. Uh, indeed. Yeah, this is foundational. Um, okay. So I know we've got a few interesting projects and we're, we're barely scratching the surface of your research lately, but let's get to the next one. Okay, um, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is um, kind of more general, um, like the opportunities that we have to use uh, machine learning and large language models to extract data from legal documents. And so for, for anyone who's like interacted with a legal document in, in the workshop, you'll know like documents are long, uh, they are complex, you have to go to law school to like really understand what's going on. Um, and so the question is like, well, can machine learning help us as researchers and as individuals? by summarizing, by finding questions to specific answers, or by pulling out specific information? And um, the answer is yes. Uh, there, there are lots of kind of applications that you can um, think of. The challenge was before large language models, a little bit to your last question, Daza, um, what you had to do is you had to kind of collect and label a bunch of information, train a model that knew nothing about law, um, and then those, those models would perform well, but the precondition was like, well, you needed to have the training data and that, that was expensive to, to come by because legal documents are long and complex and you need expertise to understand them. Now we can just ask, right? And, and machine learning people will call this zero shot learning. Um, you can give a document to a large language model and you can ask it, hey, can you uh, tell me how much the attorney made in this case? Um, and as long as that information is contained in the document, you've got a pretty good chance of being able to, to get the right answer. And then you can do a little bit of kind of prompt engineering that I'm sure Daza is going to tell you about um, to, to get even better results. But um, this really unlocks a lot. So um, I'll give you an example of, of a research project that was kind of pre-chat pre GPT days where we were interested in um, understanding uh, the attorney's fees in class action lawsuits. And um, the cool thing about class actions is an aside is that the final settlement is published and has to be approved by the judge. So usually we don't know how much attorneys earned, but class actions give us this kind of unique insight um, where there's a judicial opinion that tells us. The problem is that like, it's not always super clear. Um, and so you can see from this little extract, um, like there are all sorts of numbers floating around. Um, it's not entirely clear. Like what is the correct answer? Um, by the way, the correct answer is um, uh, 140,000, um, which is like the last sentence where the judge says, I will grant um, the petition. But there are all these other kind of numbers floating around and there's this lodestar and like, what is that? Um, so what we did um, is we just said, look, you know, this is the chat GPT playground um, based on the judicial opinion, which is long, um, identify uh, the final fee and costs awarded to the attorney um, and we can press play and uh, lo and behold, this will work. Um, and uh, the video is a little bit long, so I'm going to fast forward. Um, and it tells us dutifully that the final fees, uh, fee and costs awarded were um, 140,628, which is the right number. Um, so that's exciting, right? And that means that what we can do now is we can use, again, plug in large language models where we had problems in the past, which is like this information extraction step. Um, but then we can go on to do kind of regular, um, you know, regressions or analyses or whatever we want to do. Um, and, and this really unlocks lots of possibilities. It comes at a cost, like 12 cents per opinion. Um, but usually for, for a lot of these applications, 12, uh, yeah, uh, this is a trivial amount of money. Um, you know, maybe you want to uh, label a hundred or a thousand opinions. That's that's doable. And if the cost is an issue, if it's prohibitive, what you can do is you can label a few with ChatGPT, and then you can train a cheaper model, um, kind of fine tune a cheaper model to uh, do the labeling for you. 
Um, and that works uh, quite well as well. Um, and then so the takeaways are, you know, we can go from unstructured raw legal data to structured legal data. Um, we can do this kind of quickly and cheaply. And now we can do all sorts of interesting uh, quantitative analysis, um, you know, extracting data driven insights, uh, pulling information from different documents, um, understanding kind of historical evolution, all sorts of interesting applications. So I hope that this gets people excited about um, some of the things you can do. And uh, I'll hand it back to you, Dasa. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. And yeah, this is another great example of a project that started with the prior generation of technology and where you really just blew the ceiling off of what was possible um, with with the current generation. Um, something that I noticed that you mentioned. So one thing that I'd, I'll highlight here is I think everybody that knows law at MIT.edu knows we love structured legal data. And so you know, I feel like this is just doing such important work to, to get these natural language, kind of very narrative, fuzzy, um, you know, hard to parse, um, you know, legal documents and opinions into something that we can then use as the starting point for proper analytics and can turn that into actionable, valuable um, knowledge. Um, but there's another aspect of it that you mentioned as well, which, uh, which I'll just um, add as a kind of a segue. Um, you said, and now we can use it as training data. And I feel like if there's a theme of 2024, it's going to be, let's take a closer look at the data um, underlying these models and, and what, what having the right kind of data makes possible. Um, and, and I think that might be a good segue to your very next project. Sure. Um, what I'll do is I'll give you a quick um, example of how we've used uh, this kind of information extraction uh, in a, like a concrete research project. Um, and then I'll move to uh, the project that you're hinting at um, about uh, data provenance. So um, let's start with um, this project where we were interested in judicial impartiality. Um, and this is, you know, this like big, important pillar of justice that goes back uh, to the Book of Leviticus and, and the Magna Carta. It's hard to study impartiality um, for lots of reasons, but one of them is kind of data access. And so um, what we did is we were able to match a couple of databases together. Um, and then uh, what we did is we, we used the overlap between the structured database and the unstructured database, um, essentially as training data. Uh, and then we said, okay, based on this overlap, right, based on the cases that we're able to annotate using the structured data, can we then annotate the rest of the data? Um, and the kinds of things we were after was, how was the case decided? Uh, what kind of case was it? Was it a you know, civil rights case, a contracts case? Um, and then some other kind of like key uh, information about the judge uh, that was involved in the case. Um, we were able to create two kind of big data sets, one on case data, uh, did the plaintiff or the defendant lose, who was the judge, things like that. And then on the judges themselves, their workload, their experience, party affiliation. Um, and then we we started being able to do analysis on, on like a scale that people haven't been able to do before um, about predicting judgments uh, using factors that are unrelated to the case details, right? And uh, I won't go into kind of uh, the the methodologies too much, but the key thing is that this gives us an insight into judicial reasoning and decision making and impartiality. Um, and uh, the the kind of uh, bottom line is uh, you can see this red line at fifty um, percent. That's uh, the accuracy you would expect if you were just guessing if the judge decides for or against the plaintiff. Um, and this model trained on the the factors you see underneath, um, kind of extraneous it appears to to the case. Uh, at hand, related, of course, to judicial philosophy, but not to the specific case, does quite well. And, and for lots of cases, we can get, you know, uh, accuracy is approaching like 65, 70%. Um, so that's quite exciting. Um, so just kind of an example of how you might be able to leverage uh, this kind of uh, data. Uh, but now let me uh, tell you about data provenance, which is like, this is going to feel a little bit like a pivot. Um, but I hope that uh, people will see kind of how this is also a kind of computational law. Um, so let's see, um, let me close this, uh, and minimize this and tell you about data provenance. So, um, one kind of version of, uh, computational law is to say, can we improve the practice of law? And this is very much like, you know, insofar as there's like an inter uh, intersection between law and technology, there's kind of the, the law of technology. Lots of people are interested in regulating AI and privacy, and those are important things. Then there's the technology of law, 
uh, which is kind of like, how does technology improve the legal profession? And there, I would argue fewer people working on that. Uh, and I think there's like a lot of green uh, space that people can, um, can tackle. But even in this kind of um, law of technology area, there are some kind of blind spots, some like areas, especially when you get into like the more technical side, where I will say like a computational lawyer can really add a lot of value. Um, and this is, I think, a good example of this. So um, you might be aware that, um, you know, generative AI like ChatGPT and other models are trained on huge amounts of data. Not all of that data is uh, created equally. So you have some data that's kind of scraped from the web, you know, unstructured, large scrapes of the web. Common crawl is a good example. There are like scrapes of Wikipedia. That's usually what people think of when they talk about training data. But there's also a bunch of uh, data that was created really kind of in a custom way to train AI models to be good at certain things. People will call this fine tuning data, instruction tuning data, alignment data. Um, and the recent advances uh, in generative AI, maybe not that recent anymore, but like the advances of the last year or so, in large part uh, have, been, um, have been at least catalyzed by um, these kind of custom made data sets. So we've put together a, a team um, as part of um, this data provenance initiative of machine learning experts and lawyers uh, to try to understand and gain insight into where this data has come from, how it's being used, um, and what kind of, uh, from our perspective, kind of most interestingly, what kind of legal limitations were placed on this data. Um, this, this figure is kind of complicated, but the key part is that data sets are, are often grouped into collections of data. So you have like original sources, and then the data will appear on a place like Hugging Face or Papers with Code, and then someone will take that data and put it into a bigger collection, and then ultimately it gets used for, for um, AI development. But there are lots of stages, and people kind of get lose track of where their data is going or where the data that they're using to train their model really came from. And what we did is we um, would find the original licenses from the original sources and then categorize those licenses along a couple of important dimensions. Um, one of the ones that I'll talk about is what kind of use the license permits. Um, and so we find that um, if we look at the original kind of correct license based on the source, and then the license according to the various aggregators where the data set is hosted, um, there are a lot of errors. And you can see kind of in the reddish pinkish triangle, these are all the, the situations where something is, is incorrectly labeled. And the first column is probably the most problematic. That's where licenses according to the aggregators say, hey, commercial use of this data set is fine, um, but actually um, the commercial usage is either not permitted um, or the you know, original source doesn't mention it at all. Um, and that can pose, as you might imagine, a real issue. In doing this project, we also came up with, with another kind of interesting finding, which is to say, well, hold on a second. If this data was created for the sole purpose of training AI models, then the fair use discourse that you'll often hear um, applied to training data might not apply in the same way, right? Because the whole kind of idea of fair use is that you have the secondary purpose that is distinct from the primary purpose, right? I, I wrote an article, um, say, to be in a newspaper, and now that article is being used to uh, train an AI model. Those two purposes at least appear quite distinct. But when you create supervised data, well, you created that for the purpose of training an AI model. Um, and so fair use might not apply in the same way. There's also this question about the market effect, right? So like, if I use your poem to train my AI, does that affect the market for the poem? Of course, once I start creating new poems, that's a different question. But like the moment I've trained an AI, it's not like I've created a new poem that competes with your poem. Um, but when I steal or take your, your supervised data um, in a way that you didn't permit and I use it to train my model, well, the alternative is I would have paid you for that, right? Like I'm directly kind of competing uh, in, in for, for the market um, of your data set. So this is kind of an interesting analysis and we were actually able to um, write this up with the help of uh, folks at uh, the BU uh, Technology Law Clinic uh, as a comment to the U.S. Copyright Office. Um, so just to highlight kind of completely different, but I think still related, still kind of in this like realm of computational law um, research um, application um, of, of some of the kind of principles that I hope, you know, you'll be learning about and thinking about. Um, so handing it back to you, Daza. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, that is fascinating. And incidentally, I, I was referring to the second to last project when I said there was training data involved, uh, because obviously there was. And and you're also correct that the, you know, the crowning jewel was the last project you mentioned when it comes to just taking a closer look at this training data, uh, which is so very essential. Um, let me help you with an, an advocate's argument as to why your last project can also 
I think validly be considered computational law um, as opposed to, you know, like yet another law review article about, you know, how whatever some legal framework may or may not apply to AI or automation or technology. Um, and that is because um, just as you said, um, being a computational lawyer, which is a nice phrase, um, was so some of those skills were needed in order to do this legal analysis the first in the first place. You had to find a, a way that was um, accurate um, and and completely captured the relevant legal aspects of these licenses to, to represent that information. In, in, in a form that was data that you could then analyze and then show on things like charts and graphs. Um, and you did that, um, you know, you, uh, you all, your team did the hard work of reading um, the licenses and categorizing them correctly and then having the right kind of identifiers and metadata around each one so that you can you could do this analysis and see was there some difference between, um, you know, what the license actually permitted and restricted and how it was being characterized, if at all. And so that that to me is like that's the hard work of that's the first step of computational law is rendering the law in a form that it can be computed. Um, so anyway, that's that's my advocacy on, on behalf of your project as to why it can also totally be considered computational law, although it is you know mostly about the law of um, these data sets. So anyway, um, I think that's incredibly fascinating um, and, and it makes me want to ask what are you working on now that isn't yet capable of being you know rendered on a slide and and what do you what do you foresee um for the rest of this you know new dawning year of 2024 and into 2025 like what's on the horizon at the cutting edge of MIT research in this area of computational law with a heavy emphasis and thumb on the scale for generative ai that's a good question. Um, there are a couple things. So we're, you know, of course, these projects are all like, you know, it's by definition, it's early stage, right? So there's like next steps for for essentially all of the things I've talked about today. Um, we are, for example, trying to really build out this retrieval augmented generation platform and really think about how do you design a platform like this? Maybe even, you know, what would be exciting would be to go to to like, you know, pro se litigants and give them a tool like this and see like, how does it change how they interact? Um, with the courtroom, with kind of legal questions, um, kind of more of the human computer interaction side of things. Um, another, uh, you know, big kind of research project that we've been grappling with, as you know, for, for quite a while, is um, we, we can kind of start thinking of, of law as like a network. And we're starting to kind of like think of like, well, citation networks, and you have all these documents along the way. But that begs the question like, well, you know, common law, as you know, judge-made law has evolved in some way. Can we kind of get a better understanding, a better grasp of that evolution? Um, so I think that's like a key research problem. Um, and and honestly, like it's been on the one hand, we're overwhelmed because we have all of this new data, all of these new tools. Um, on the other hand, it's like non-trivial to to think of like a system of knowledge and try to say, well, where does it come from? Where is it going? Um, who are like maybe the the key people who are changing it or the key events that have changed it? Like, can we find moments in history? moments in law that have kind of given rise to new changes. All those kinds of questions um, seem incredibly well suited um, to computational law and computational legal analysis. And then finally, there's kind of a broader, like what does the practice of law look like? Like what does the business of law look like? And it's early days for that. Um, and we can see lots of folks misusing these tools, misunderstanding these tools, but I think it's pretty clear that the legal profession will embrace a lot of generative AI tools, a lot of large language models, and the clients of lawyers, which we sometimes forget about, but they really matter, right? Like the clients of lawyers will also be embracing those tools and also making the connection, hey, is my attorney who's billing me like $1,000 an hour or more, is, is she using these tools? Because if not, then I'd like to know why I'm being billed all these hours, right? So um, I think that there's going to be kind of interesting shifts in the legal profession, uh, that that are worthy of, of research in and of themselves, right? And understanding how you deal with legal risk, how you manage legal services, um, understanding the you know the law. There's so many questions, honestly, um, kind of an overwhelming number. So um, we'll be busy at work, and uh, yeah, if people are excited about this, then then I've done my job. So hopefully there'll be lots lots more people working on this stuff. Um, so <laughs> thank you. Uh, this was very fun. <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well, I think people, I'm excited, and I, I know other people are too. This has probably been one of the most requested segments is like a, just a research update. Um, so, but while I have you, before we, before we end, I've got one sort of like extra question for you. And it's partly because you are really still fairly freshly out of law school. Like what, what would you graduate a couple of years ago or something like that, two, three. So you, you probably remember it better than I do. Um, and well, the question I would have is, what do you foresee, not so much in the practice of law, which you just started to go over and in research, of course, and industry, but what about for law school itself? Like, what, what do you think are, what would be some of the good directions for law schools to look at as, as ways to reckon with, to recognize and to start to address, and I would say to support and reflect the advent of generative AI as, as a part of law practice? Like, well, what, what sorts of activities or courses or skills or, or other implications? Um, and let me just start as a starting point with um, I'm Acme Law School, and I've decided to prohibit use of generative AI for like any meaningful aspect of legal education. So if you start from that baseline, what more might be possible with the um, liberalization of some of those types of restrictions? And what, what kind of application of generative AI would be, you know, kind of beneficial and appropriate or maybe even necessary for competent, you know, well-educated, ready-to-practice lawyers coming out of law school? Yeah. So I, I'm actually probably more receptive to to the argument like, hey, you know, we shouldn't have this, these kinds of tools and in law schools because they'll they'll prevent us from learning about the law. Like I, I think that there is a little bit of something to this argument. And I don't think that I could have done the research that I've gone on to do without like, you know, the slog of like using Lexis and Westlaw and the other legal research platforms, understanding what a key site and what a head note is and shepherdization. Like you do have to learn those things the way you have to probably learn long division and other kinds of things, even though it's not actually used day to day. However, it also makes sense to me that you would learn a little bit, maybe not about the specific tools and vendors, but more about like the risks and the limitations and the opportunities. Like as a lawyer, I need to understand um, how, what kind of precedent I can cite, right? And I need to understand that like some things are good law and some things are bad law. Well, by the same token, I need to understand like, what are the tools out there um, that will retrieve cases? What are the tools that will let me, you know, compile cases into arguments? And I really expect that legal practice is going to embrace those, um, but we need some kind of AI literacy among the lawyers who will use the tools, not because that they're, they're going to be developing those tools necessarily, but because they, that kind of literacy is needed to do responsible kind of legal technology usage, right? To, to responsibly use these tools. Um, so that's kind of one side of things. So yes, it's fine if you need to do manual legal research, it also seems highly appropriate for there to be at least one class um, that covers some of the kind of more AI literacy topics. However, the other thing that I think is a real opportunity for law schools with clinics is to say, well, the purpose of clinics is one, kind of practice oriented, and two, it's to serve clients, right? And so it seems like there's an interesting opportunity to consider like the existence of like a meta clinic, a clinic that develops and and helps law school students who are interested in developing tools um you know help the other clinics um so like a clinic for the other clinics kind of thing and i think that um especially now that some of these tools have become very accessible right it, you don't need a computer science degree to be able to use chat gpt um so by the same token you don't need a lot of technical know-how you need kind of design thinking skills but you don't need a lot of technical know-how to build really impactful tools um, and uh, I think that there's a really cool opportunity for law schools to start kind of not just encouraging their students uh, to build these tools to train that muscle if they want to, but to do so in a really impactful way. Um, and maybe also to dabble, cross over into uh, some of the like human computer interaction literature and communities and start kind of exploring like what do these kinds of tools look like um, and, and how do we design them responsibly. Um, so. There's lots of options for law schools. Uh, I think it's an exciting time, actually, uh, to be a law school, to be a law school professor. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm, I'm, you know, I remain always the optimist um, that that law schools will find ways to kind of integrate this into the syllabus syllabi um, in in productive, responsible ways. Here, here. Um, well, may it be so. And uh, you know, I I did have a little ulterior motive, which is I'm hearing now from more and more of my 
um, friends and colleagues at law schools who are sharing really innovative ways they're, they're starting to integrate use of generative AI into their pedagogy and into their syllabi um, and the curriculums. And, um, and you know, there's a thousand flowers blooming right now. But um, w one thing I can say for sure is uh, I love what the way that you're incorporating it into your research. And um, I can't wait to see what you come up with next. So thanks very much for taking the time to share um, what you've been working on, uh, Robert. And, uh, and you know, um, don't, don't be shy about sharing um, the next um, kind of flock of projects when they come up and, and I'll be sure to, to vector them right into the stream. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me. Take care. Thanks.